and welcome to Power Problems, a podcast from the Cato Institute, where we offer a skeptical take on US foreign policy and discuss some of today's big questions in international security with guests from across the political spectrum. I'm Emma Ashford. And I'm Trevor Thrall. Scholars have long debated the extent to which the US is an interventionist power from the westward expansion to the modern era. But while we talk a lot about intervention, we often don't have the, mo- the kind of data that I'd actually like to see to analyze the question. Um, The data that we do have is pretty disturbing. More than one third of all interventions in American history have happened since 1999. And the rate of interventions, whether it's special forces or drones, air campaigns, or a full-scale Iraq-style invasion, only seems to be growing. A new project at Tufts University is trying to quantify military intervention to help us understand why this happened, what we might be able to do about it, um, and where the US goes from here. So joining us today is Monica Toff, the director of that military intervention project and a professor at Tufts University. Monica, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted. So we usually talk a little about the news at the start of our show, but since we're taping this a little ahead of when it's going to be released, um, I'm going to avoid specific news bits for today. Um, Instead, I thought we could take a few minutes and talk about something that's rapidly shaping up into a big theme of the 2020 presidential campaign. Um, And that's the link between foreign policy and economics. Um, So like a lot of foreign policy scholars, they tend to try and avoid that question, but the Trump administration has really made it very apparent. And if you look at some of the 2020 Democratic contenders, notably Elizabeth Warren, we see that even on the Democratic side of the aisle, candidates are trying to equate economic security with national security. Security. Um, So I guess the question that I have from all of this is whether we as foreign policy specialists should be caring more about economics. Is it essential to national security in the way that these candidates are suggesting? Well, I'll take a first stab at that. And I think indeed, in fact, I think we're sort of looking backward at this particular moment in time, because if you want to think about the the link between trade and U.S. foreign policy in the 1970s with the oil crisis um, and thinking through what that meant, and it actually got us even more fully engaged in the Middle East, trying to secure our energy supplies. And so I think with that, it, it, it's quite critical. So in the international level, I think that, that economics has always been part of foreign policy. And then domestically, um, um, I think when we start thinking about our educational system, thinking about jobs, and you can think about demographically uh, what our workforce is going to be looking like as well, um, I think that economics is absolutely vital uh, to the health of the country and then how we sort of turn that or translate that into the security of the country. So I think it's both operates at the domestic level and the international level. Uh, and we sort of forgot about it for a while in the 1990s and then into the 2000s. Uh, I think the recession of 2008 brought it back. Uh, But now we're in this recovery. But I I agree that the candidates are raising it as an issue uh, because we're facing uh, profound changes, um, uh, both domestically, but then internationally in terms of trade um, and and, and the soundness of our economy vis-a-vis other economies. Yeah. I think, and just to build on that, I think it, it feels to me like we haven't spent that long talking about this in D.C. in a while, because I sense that we don't have a coherent, neither side, Republican or Democratic side, has a coherent message about how these things connect domestic and and international. And I I worry a little bit about sort of the two, the, the Scylla and Charybdis for me of these things is on the one hand, the way Trump talks about these things is economic security as national security is going to, is, is a potential driver towards some kind of isolationism or detachment in unhealthy, I think, ways. And on the other hand, I hear people like Elizabeth Warren and some others talk about trade in ways that make me worry that we're going to get entangled in things sort of like we thought we need to control the whole Middle East to keep oil flowing. Mm -hmm. Um, There are ways in which economics can drag us into things we shouldn't be in. Mm -hmm. So figuring out exactly the right way to connect, you know, economic concerns with foreign policy issues is, I think, still a project. You know, for for me, I think the interesting thing is this gets back to a definitional debate that, you know, PhD students have when they're talking about sources of national strength, right? It's such an old debate. It's how do you measure military capability? How do you measure national capabilities and how how fungible is the the sort of domestic economy and you can turn that into military strength? That's like a debate that's decades old, probably older than that. But that seems to be the debate that that 
we're having in the Trump administration. Um, you know, whether it's the sort of slightly more nuanced Elizabeth Warren style arguments about, you know, human capital and education or infrastructure on the Democratic side of the aisle, or Donald Trump saying, well, we we need steel exports in order to be militarily strong. And it seems like we are basically returning to that definitional debate. No, I think that's right. And if you look from if you want to continue along the academic track, typically we defined power with two measures. It was typically GDP per capita. So our peer competitors had a similar GDP per capita or or close to us uh, and population. And I think it's time to change and think about power differently and differentially. Uh, But you're right. I do feel as if, particularly with the Trump administration, it's back to the industrial complex and and, and, and mighty steel. Uh, When the world, of course, as we know, silicon chips and and, and, and computational uh, power is actually uh, one of the bigger sources of strength uh, for an economy. So we haven't, I agree with you, Trevor, that we need to have this conversation about what actually constitutes economic power today and then how that will sort of feed into national security and and, and into power that we can project, assuming we want to project it. And uh, we have not had that conversation. Um, I think the one place we've had it is the domestic level, but not moving to the international level, which is why I think uh, the Trump administration, in particular President Trump, has been able to sort of dominate the conversation because he's pushing forward his view and we don't yet have a counter to it. Yeah. No, I I mean, I think that's, you know, America first. And I've said this before. It's like, who would want a foreign policy that didn't put America first? And yet, um, you know, his way of understanding that just smells like 1980. Uh, you know, it's almost like we're going to go for an autarkic vision where we build all the steel and, and stuff ourselves and we don't need the rest of the world. And, you know, I mean, I, his understanding is so backwards. And yet I don't I haven't heard an articulation that I sort of say, yep, that's now how I'm going to think about it. Mm-hmm. So. Well, we have talked on this podcast a number of times about some of these issues in the specific context. And the context uh, uh, that we, that's come up recently a lot is Huawei, right? And we've talked about the security implications of interdependence and, you know, is that a problem for national security? But the Trump administration is making a broader argument there, right? They're making an argument that trade interdependence actually makes us weaker, which runs against, I mean, the, the standard argument for the last several decades. Mm-hmm. No, I think that that's right. And, you know, again, back to Trevor's, I mean, that that's exactly right. But we have yet to have that conversation. So what I'm hoping is, is that through the debates, right, that the candidates can sort of challenge him on that sort of backward looking, sort of anachronistic kind of thinking, because of, of course, industry um, has moved forward in different ways. Uh, and the whole interdependence debate, we're not sure where that's going to land, uh, given that most of our products are, you know, are not produced domestically. They're produced in tandem with other countries, and then components are shipped back and forth across different borders. So the idea that we're going to be autarkic in this modern era um, is just a sort of a fallacy. And so it'll be interesting to see how the candidates, uh, whoever they, whoever emerges, um, sort of take this on uh, in the future. Yes, and hopefully we'll be down a few candidates by the time this has been released. Uh, at present, when we're recording this, we're, we're sitting through democratic debates with more than 20 candidates on the stage. So once the field narrows a little, perhaps we'll get some more substantive debates on these questions. Mm-hmm. So, okay, let's move on then to our main topic of the day, which in contrast to this debate is actually um, a debate that we've been having over the last two decades and we've been having constantly, which is about U.S. intervention. Um, So, Monica, the the project that you're managing at Tufts is basically trying to quantify um, the question of U.S. intervention. And so we can look at our recent history and we can say, well, the U.S. has intervened a, a lot of places. We've intervened in Iraq and Libya and uh, we've intervened in Syria, but you know we haven't really quantified those interventions. So perhaps you could start us off just by talking a little about why this matters, what you're trying to do with the project, um, why it's interesting. Yeah. So the project we started, I pulled together a team. So I'm at the Fletcher School at Tufts, and so I have a team of really smart um, uh, graduate students and then some postdoc fellows uh, and PhD candidates. And so what we've done is, is we pulled together uh, a data set of all U.S. interventions since the founding of the country. And and I thought this was really important because as a student of war, and in particular civil wars, I had written a couple of books. And I had noticed that, first of all, civil wars is the most common form of large-scale violence today. 
Uh, two, it's uh, uh, what I discovered is is that when outside parties intervene, they often extend already long wars. And so it started. And then if you look at who the interveners are, the United States tends to be a number one culprit, either unilaterally getting involved or multilaterally through the UN or through NATO, for instance. And so the question I had was, you know, uh, what does this mean for U.S. foreign policy? And I think more importantly, uh, what does it mean for national security? Are we actually securing our our interests uh, when we go into these conflicts? And to my dismay, actually, uh, there was no other data set like this. And so I decided, OK, I'm going to pull together this team and we're going to pull together the, the definitive data set on all these interventions to find out historically what was happening. And then based on that, uh, what could we say and uh, and speak to policy on these issues? And as you already alluded to at the beginning of this segment, that um, it, there's a disproportionate number of interventions since the end of the Cold War and in particular since the end of 2001. And what I mean by that, when we talk about intervention, we're, our data set's unique in that we're not only talking about the overt use of force, but we're also talking about the threat of the use of force and the display of use of force. So looking at the escalatory ladder um, from moving from um, uh, the display of force, use of force, um, um, and then also on to war. And what we've noticed is that at least since 2000, that we've resorted to the usage of force uh, much more so than we did in prior periods. And so from my perspective and from the analytic perspective, um, that's a bit worrisome because we're not sort of stepping back and saying, OK, is the deployment of troops, personnel, which is our most val uh, valuable asset in the United States, but then also materiel, is that really uh, the best way to go? And is it securing our national interests? And is it securing the objectives that the statesman and the, the military is saying that we're trying to achieve? And our sense is actually no. Um, and we're not alone. I mean, we're not just beating up on the United States on this. In some cases, it does work and we, we do secure our interests. But in a number of cases, we don't. Um, you can We can talk about the Soviet Union and its efforts, you know, uh, when it was in existence and it, it often did not prevail. And what it, it it's part of a broader trend about the changing nature of power uh, and the fact that great powers, I already talked about common measures, GDP per capita and population, uh, these common measures are not indicative of, of success. And one of the reasons is that our interlocutors, the states that we're intervening upon, um, are learning how to innovate around what we're doing. And one of the reasons I think that we are more engaged is that we're also innovating. And what I mean by that is, is that we're now adopting special operations forces and drone strikes, right, uh, in counter uh, to counter um, sort of these struggles, these, these um, um, situations uh, globally. Uh, and so, um, um, uh, you know, it's sort of feeding this cycle. Uh, and what's interesting about the drone strikes and the special operations, and we know this particularly after the Niger conflict um, or crisis, um, even our Congress people aren't sure where all of these personnel are deployed and what their missions are. And so people were shocked by Niger and said, oh, my gosh, we didn't even know. So we're trying to categorize that. We think it's incredibly important and uh, and sort of inf inform both academics and the, and the public, but also policymakers about this uh, because it's such a critical, vital issue. And despite the fact that we're doing more, we're actually getting less for what we're doing. And we can talk about defense spending and how it's basically um, uh, ratcheting up um, and it's not getting us what we need in terms of securing our borders and our homeland. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's, that's three just very disturbing things. You know, interventions are increasing. Um, the sort of escalatory level of those interventions is also increasing. So we're using force at a higher level more often. And then we seem to be less successful in using force. And that's three takeaways from this data. Um, but but that just leads me to the question of why are we doing this? So do you guys try to um, assess the strategy behind these military interventions? Do we know why we're intervening more? Yeah, it's a great question. So we're working on that now. And so we have over 200 different variables looking at both the cause for why we're intervening and the arguments given uh, by a particular administration and then the consequences. Um, and I think part of it, and, and, and I've written a couple of pieces on this, is sort of foregoing um, uh, diplomacy. Right. And so we've the State Department has been seriously underfunded for decades. It's not just under the current administration. It's been for a while. Um, and I think there's a sense that um, uh, 
that the use of force uh, is the only tool that we have in our in our in our toolbox. Uh, so in a piece on the war on the rocks, I talked about hammers and nails, and so we have this you know security hammer, um, and 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 then all the nails. Of course, if it's the only tool you have, you're going to start seeing screws as nails. Um, and so I think that that's part of the problem is that. Um, uh, it, that we've so underfunded uh, the, the State Department that diplomacy uh, has become less um, um, uh, of a tool that we can rely on. The other thing I think is, is that, you know, we did have success at the end of the Cold War, right, in the United States helping to sort of uh, help the Soviet Union sort of g- go to its demise under the uh, George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, and we were quite successful in some parts of the world, although if you really go back with a critical eye, the wars in former Yugoslavia are technically still not resolved, right? Uh, Somalia was a fiasco, uh, and Somalia was such a fiasco that we weren't able to do anything in Rwanda, right? Uh, probably one of the most horrific genocides we've witnessed um, in the post-Cold War period. And so when, you know, when you're looking back at it, I think there was this hubris humility thing that we were quite hubristic in what we thought we could accomplish. And we need a little bit more humility about it. Um, so that's the second thing is, is that because we prevailed during the Cold War. And the third is, is I think and the United States likes technological fixes. We're now in a period where we're using a lot more special operators, which keeps us under the radar in terms of actually committing troops um, and more publicly. Um, and then we have drones. So with the advent of the drone, we think that we can, you know, surgically strike and without putting troops on the ground, without worrying about um, uh, American blood being spilled, that we can achieve our our goals. And I think that those three reasons explain how we got where we are. And so it's now time to sort of pull back and reflect, okay, what else can we doing? Uh, we we be doing and perhaps in partnership with some allies, regional powers and regional partners. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, this is all, you know, a lot to talk about. So many things I, I could ask you here, but I'm I'm particularly interested in something that has been occurring to me recently, which is that, uh, and I'm thinking here, uh, sort of motivated by uh, Martha Finnemore's wonderful book, The Purpose of Intervention, and how the reason that great powers tend to intervene around the world has changed sort of era by era. And it seems to me that one of the reasons that the United States has had trouble finding success, uh, as defined by whichever administration, you know, its own words even, is because a lot of the things we're actually trying to do are not things that militaries were ever built to do. And this goes to the changing nation, uh, nature of power, but also the, the sort of the changing things we're trying to get done in the world. And when you're trying to take over territory, great. Trying to break something, fantastic. Trying to rebuild a country, trying to in, in, convince terrorists not to hold ideologies. How the heck are you supposed to do that? Mm-hmm. No one has that formula as far as I can tell. So that sort of, I think, would help explain why you keep trying because it's not working yet. So let's do more, but also why you're never getting there because you're never going to get there. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, so even let's talk about Somalia it was to alleviate famine. Right. And and actually, we were successful in that. The problem is we changed the mission, which was we were going to take out the tribal warlords. But then what? Uh, similarly, in Libya, not thinking through the whole steps of, OK, if you take out Gaddafi and you prevent, and I think we, we really did try to prevent uh, what we thought was going to happen was a genocide or a pl- politicide, an Im- imminent one. But what's next? And and we don't, the United States, we tend not to think about the second, third, and fourth order effects of when we go in. And, you know, I, you know, I always reflect back about the United States and its, its experience with its own civil war, right, the Reconstruction period, which when did that end? Um, some people make the argument that it didn't even end until the civil rights period, and actually it's still ongoing, right? We're having debates today about reparations, right? And so the idea is, is that if we can't even think about our own house and how to order it, what makes us think we can go into these societies and do it? Um, and 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 it, and 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 un- overestimating the degree to which we can sort of um, um, get actors on the ground, get society sort of reorganized and retooled such that they can keep their own house in order. And so, again, it's back to this hubris, um, um, humility thing, just sort of stepping back and having an appreciation and perhaps learning from our own history, right? Uh, And then saying, okay, maybe we can't do it. Maybe we can enable them to do it or work with partners, allies, regional bodies to perhaps do it and and, and hopefully do a better job than what we've been able to do. Yeah. And I I think the prioritization of foreign policy tools is something that's come out pretty strongly in a lot of your writing on this. And I was was really struck by the statistic you had. I think this was 
from last year, so it's a little out of date. But you said the U.S. has ambassadors to about a third of the world's countries, and we have special ops forces operating in three quarters of them. And that is a stunning disparity. Um, and, and I mean, I the question I have when I look at the statistic is, is this simply the privileging of military means over diplomacy? Um, or is this that we are just trying to do too much generally and the military is the tool we have available? So is this sort of, you know, budgets chasing problems or problems chasing budgets. I'm not really sure which way that causality arrow goes. Yeah, no, and I think that's a great way to put it, Emma, because I'm not sure either. Um, and the question is, is why is it that we don't sort of trust and respect that the State Department, right, with its experts, uh, many of whom have regional and country level expertise, uh, can be relied on more so? And I think that the disparity uh, in the number of diplomats and ambassadors who are deployed or, you know, who are on assignment um, is reflective of that. And again, back to my earlier comment about how the United States loves technology. Right now, part of that is just basic American lobbying. Big ships bring big money and lots of jobs into constituencies. So I think domestic politics matters a lot here. Whereas U.S. foreign policy, we know that Americans tend not to think about U.S. foreign policy on its own terms. Um, it tends to be second order or third order. It's the economy, right? And And so DOD... Um, you know, budgets, you can bring bases, you can bring weapons systems, and you can bring jobs. And so it makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then I, so I think that's one of the problems. And the second is, is I think we're in a time uh, where we don't appreciate, respect, and elevate expertise. And so even if you look at the current administration, um, uh, an indicator of that is the number of appointees at, at the ambassadorial level um, who have actual experience in the regions or in country. Uh, it's flipped, right? Um, so 57 percent are now um, uh, political appointees when prior to this administration it was always around 30 percent. And it's just a lack of appreciation um, of, of not respecting uh, what State Department personnel have to offer. So I think it's a combination of factors, Emma. Um, and I think that they're exasperated even more under this current administration. Let me throw out another sort of question for you just to follow up on that, which is what do you think the role of sort of threat perceptions by by our leaders is? Because it seems to me that there was a market shift I mean, there's always been hawks and doves in D.C., but it seems like after 9-11, you know, terrorism kind of hijacked U.S. foreign policy and it it put maybe into overdrive the the sort of the threat mania that that hawks oh, have always sort of had, but it, it took it to another level because I have seen commencement speeches. I have seen people on TV who were directors of the CIA, uh, the secretaries of defenses, and the common refrain, you could you could make a uh, hour-long video of just this one sentence, we now live in a more dangerous world than ever. I have trouble seeing that myself if you're the United States, but it's this is a constant refrain here in DC. And if you believe that, if you honestly believe that, then of course you're going to go play whack-a-mole in three quarters of the world's countries because it's so dangerous out there. But But the question I have for you is, do you think that people really believe that the world is more dangerous or is this a cover for all the other things that you just discussed, like it's good for our friends in the defense industry or it's good for politics or, or something else? Yeah, I, it's a great question. I think some people do believe that we live in a more... Uh, dangerous world. I think there's no denying that. Uh, they look at the news, violence on TV. Uh, right now, we're in the situation with Iran, you know, the escalation happening and, and a drone being shot down. Uh, they see terrorist attacks in Europe. And again, I, I think ed education here and, and basic knowledge not realizing that the Europeans have always been subject, unfortunately, to, to terrorist attacks. I mean, in the 1970s, it was the leftist red brigades. And and it's striking that the Europeans, I don't want to say they've learned to live with terrorism. They haven't. You know, they've been putting into place surveillance systems and intelligence and, 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 and work trying to work together to sort of counter it. But for the United States, it's new. I think there was a big reaction and actually an overreaction to what happened on 9-11. Uh, and it was an intelligence problem. I mean, first and foremost, when you read the report, the 9-11 report, what you see is actually it was an intelligence problem. It was not a Department of Defense problem. Um, and so what, what's happened in the meantime is, is that um, we've gone to a zero failure right, and zero risk sort of environment, which I think is a bit unreasonable, particularly for a country that values freedom, right? Well, we do, but there's always been this tension between those who don't want any risk or order 
above freedom um, and uh, look authorizing the president you know and now we've got this you know um, you know uh, 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 he's allowed or you know uh, or perhaps she um, uh, in the future is allowed to sort of deploy forces without having to go through Congress and you know and, and uh, the question is, is whether that's going to be repealed, whether it's going to be changed. Um, but that was directly in response to 2001 and the perpetrators of that. And of course, now we're seeing that being extended. Um, and my big question with this data is, is how much have we created or recreated problems that we were trying to resolve earlier? And and my sense is, is that we're actually creating problems uh, that we hadn't anticipated because we're actually not dealing with the issue properly, which my sense is that it's mainly intelligence problems. We have a very good intel. We have not had another 9-11. Um, and the Department of Defense, you said this earlier, it may not be the best suited to do this. Uh, USAID, that their, writ, their job is to actually help countries to develop and by the way, help the countries themselves to develop. So think about that. Um, and um, it's it's not necessarily a Department of Defense that that should be doing that first and foremost. You know, the other thing that comes out of the data for me is you you have a, a breakdown of, on the websites uh, for the project where you basically look at the shift over time in where this is happening. And so we talk about the Middle East a lot, but the data actually suggests that that's not really where a lot of these interventions are happening, particularly in recent years, that we're shifting towards Africa. And so what I worry about is sort of what you just said, that we are recreating problems or perhaps even creating them in some of these countries. We're so worried about terrorism on the sort of, call it the Middle Eastern model, right? But we're worried about Al-Qaeda shifting into all of these new countries and that it's our reaction to that, our intervention and reaction to that concern that is itself um, driving some of those problems. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's right. Um, you know, AFRICOM now is in existence and, uh, you know, and there are these organizations, these affiliates of, of Al Qaeda or perhaps ISIS. Um, you know, we know that if you kill somebody, right, that chances are their brother, their mother, their sister, their father um, are not going to take a liking to us. And so you end up creating more terrorists or more problems down the line. Um, and again, like Niger, I mean, it caught the American public, but it, but also, you know, policymakers on Capitol Hill, like, why are we there? Why are we doing that? Um, and, uh, you know, the anti-Western is not just anti-U.S., but with these terrorist organizations, it's an anti-Western bias. They do not like our lifestyle. They want to shut it down. Um, and so the question is, is, okay, if you kill them, right, if you go in and you, you take out some of them, is that going to nip the problem in the bud? Or do we need to think about other ways of, 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 of countering them, counter narratives, counter education? And some people say just basic development, that oftentimes these terrorist organizations are the only job in town and people get paid a certain amount. I don't think that's all of it. I do think some of these people, men and women, are true believers to the cause. Um, but I think you're exactly right, Emma, in the sense that by every time we do an operation like this, then we are seen as the bad guy. And it just sort of feeds on itself um, over time. Um, and um, we end up creating uh, a bigger problem than what we anticipated when we went in to begin with. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that just to piggyback on that, that we now look at the entire continent of Africa as a safe haven, right? I mean, this is the argument why we can't get out of all of Afghanistan is because it, you never know where a terrorist organization might might pop up there. And that's a ridiculous argument on its face, because if you think about it, that then you'd have to have the same argument about every other country where there's an Al-Qaeda. Oh, wait, we, we are doing that. We, we're making that exact argument because we are operating almost all over the place in Africa right now for this express purpose. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just through arms sales or security assistance, but increasingly through special forces. And, mm -hmm. and as you pointed out, I think one of the key things, I just want to highlight this again, is the political risk of sending a few special operators somewhere is very low. Because mm -hmm. as long as you're the president, you don't talk about it. It's never going to make the news. And, you know, I don't even know that we always know when some of these guys die, frankly, mm -hmm. which is really sad. Yeah. But but if you keep the numbers low, the risks are pretty low. And so it means there's a lot of it. And so yeah. this is something I think is going to continue until somebody stops it. No, and I agree. So, you know, two points on that. One is, is you're absolutely right about Africa, and we are highly engaged across the entire continent. And what I'd say is it's constituted of 57 different countries. 
And some of them are more developed than others. And, and some of them, you know, are not problematic. Uh, and so we may be actually making situations more problematic. Uh, and secondarily, you know, General Dunford came out more recently um, and said that as we're starting to think about sort of peer competitor in China and to some extent Russia with the nuclear, uh, that we need to turn to diplomacy more in Africa. Right. So this is a guy who's looking at AFRICOM and thinking. So you do see a little bit of shifting, uh, but it's DOT, right, Uh, because they're realizing they're overstretched. Because when you talk about these special operators, you know, we've tripled the number of special operators. These men and women, right, are extraordinarily talented and unique, right, because you have to be smart. You have to have linguistic ability. uh, You have to be willing and, and, and able to put yourself in harm's way. Team player. Right? There's a lot of demands put on these individuals in order for them to be effective. Not every American can do it. And so, and, and then on top of that, the ones that we do have that manage to get through all of that extraordinary training and dedicate themselves to these missions, um, uh, they're overtaxed, right? And so you have at any moment, the latest figure I saw is you have 8,300 of them out of a force, uh, you know, uh, special operations command is about 70,000 personnel, 8,300 of them, you know, deployed. And and so the question is, is how, you know, they themselves are handling this uh, and can we sustain these numbers, which I'm not convinced we can, which is why I think we're starting now to rely on sort of drone technologies and not putting the boots on the ground. Uh, so you you talk about not knowing where the special operators are. We don't even know where the drones are operating and what those drones are doing. Um, and then the collateral damage. I mean, talk about, you know, again, thinking through there, you know, people on the ground are going to see, OK, that's an American weapon system. OK, they're now our, you know, they're now our enemy. And, and what are they going to what's that child that sees that and witnesses a friend being killed? And uh, how are they going to respond to this? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a huge problem, uh, you know, and we're talking here about intervention broadly. Um, and you're not criticizing the the techniques that we're using. You're not criticizing the Defense Department or the personnel that we have on the ground. It, it seems to me more that your, your problem here is that intervention is just so prevalent. Mm-hmm. And it seems so, you know, Trevor, you already talked about the whack-a-mole. And that's what, so if you look at it in the past, we had missions, right? What we were trying to do, positive missions. So, you know, early on, we were trying to become independent of Britain. Then we were trying to expand West in our territory. And by the way, those were foreign interventions into Indian territory, right? Native American territories. Then we were concerned about, you know, World War I and sort of coming out of isolationism because we were so bent on, you know, getting established as a country. Then it was trying to stop, you know, totalitarianism taking over Europe and Asia. Then it was, you know, so there was there were different ways in which the United States was organizing its its strategy, stopping World War III. Right. That was the next. And then and then the next phase was trying to sort of uh, help to develop a post-Cold War order. Um, and we grappled with that. And we did not come to terms with that. Where Where is the peace dividend? Where is the scaling back, the drawing back? And again, that was a moment where we were quite hubristic in what we could do. Um, and then 9-11 happened. And since 9-11, we have been grappling for, do we face a peer competitor in China? What about Russia? It still has a formidable nuclear arsenal. What about Iran and, 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 and North Korea? And so I think, Emma, in response to you is, is, I think we have to have a national conversation about what it is that we think is going to secure our nation best. Um, and you know, what I like to do when I talk to my students is say, we're extraordinarily secure as a nation. Right. We have two moats. Uh, we have um, uh, on our borders our friendly nations, Canada and Mexico. Yes, there's a crisis on the Mexican border, uh, but we know how to deal with this. We are we are a country of immigrants. Right. Um, uh, but because of this lack of sort of, you know, um, a broader sort of national strategy about what we want to achieve and who we are as a nation, I think we're getting mired into these conflicts, you know, in Afghanistan, Syria and now Yemen, and we'll see what happens with Iran. You know, for me at least, just as as somebody who talks about these issues on a regular basis, the question that I have that I don't have a good answer for is whether it's more important to try and withdraw from the current interventions that we have, dial those down, or whether it's more important to try and prevent 
future interventions. And, and I can see arguments for both, but the data that you're sort of looking at here suggests, I think, that, that it's all a problem and we might need to take a broader approach. Yeah. And I think the data do show that. I think the data show that we need to think about development um, in countries and um, and, you know, think about, you know, giving perhaps more. Um, the, most Americans overestimate how much development aid we actually give out around the world. Um, but then also putting it on to partners. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the United States alone. The polling's quite clear that uh, Americans support the idea of the United States playing a major role, but not a leading role. Right. So there might be, you know, allies, uh, friendly partners, regional partners, uh, the United Nations. Right. Uh, perhaps um, the OSCE uh, uh, working to do this um, uh, and trying to help with that. And then really thinking through trying to get extricated from the conflicts that we're involved in, including Afghanistan and also Syria, and thinking through what are our national interests, uh, maybe scaling back slowly, but in some cases, maybe it's just time to come home and bring the troops home um, and, and do some offshore balancing and thinking about restraint as we move forward uh, so that we don't get mired down in yet another conflict. Um, some people you know, claim uh, some data that we're currently involved in seven conflicts and most Americans are completely unaware of that, that we're actively engaged in seven conflicts. They're unaware. And part of it is they're not paying for it. We don't have bonds being issued. Um, and the defense budget, we could you know, talk about that. Um, just the base budget, budget um, it doesn't even account for how much we're actually spending on securing this nation. It's not even half. Some people put the number. Right now, our base budget is about $550 you know, um, billion, dollars, but some people say if you add on intelligence, state, defense, um, I'm missing quite a oh, 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 call, um, the, the overseas uh, contingent operations. We're up to almost $1.3 trillion in defending this nation at a time when the United States is probably the most secure it's ever been. Um, if you look at um, uh, just some of the indicators about how secure we are as a nation. Oh, I think that's a pretty good place to leave it. Thank you so much for joining us, Monica. I really look forward to seeing the final data set when it's done. Um, thanks to our producer, Cecil Sherman, and to you all for listening at home. If you want to continue the conversation, our Twitter handle is at Power Problems. And if you like the show, please do leave us a good review on iTunes or wherever else you find your podcasts.